everyone. I'm Judith Green, Professor of Sociology and Director of the Wellcome Centre for Cultures and Environments of Health. And I'm absolutely delighted to see so many familiar and a few new faces here at our annual public lecture. Uh, welcome. I'm sorry we're not actually in the centre at Exeter, but the upside of that is I think there are some of you who've joined and I'm uh, apologies for those for whom this is uh, not such a social time of the day, but I can see a few people I know from, from um, places in different time zones. So very a, a very big welcome to all. So my task is to introduce our speaker and we're delighted to welcome Professor Robert Walker uh, to give our annual lecture on what can we believe about COVID-19. Professor Walker is an Emeritus Fellow at Green Templeton College and also an Associate Fellow and Emeritus at the Department of Social Policy and Intervention at the University of Oxford and also Professor of Social Policy and Development at Beijing Normal University where he's based at the moment. He's currently um, a Fellow at the Schorenstein Centre on Media, Politics and P Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School where he's been working on understanding China's response to the COVID-19 epidemic through the lens of local and international media. And I, I believe that's what he's gonna be drawing on for us uh, today. Just a couple of words about um, Professor Walker. He was awarded an MBE by the Queen in 2012 for his services to social policy research and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and the Academy of Social Sciences. And many of you, I think, will be familiar with his book, The Shame of Poverty, published in 2014, which was a groundbreaking work, bringing global insights to our understanding of how poverty operates, not just through material, but also through those sort of psychosocial um, pathways, particularly shame. Um, and also his co-edited volume, Social Policy in a Developing World, which I think was also 2014. So I'm not gonna take up much more time. I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Robert Walker now. And just to say that there will be some time hopefully for questions and discussion at the end of the talk. So please feel free to add those questions perhaps as they come up to the chat or, um, or uh, wait till the end of the talk, but feel free to pop them in now and we'll try and keep an eye. So without further ado, Professor Robert Walker, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. And thank you all of you for, for being here, wherever you're here happens to be. I want to talk, as Judy says, about the work that I have been doing while a virtual fellow at the Shorenstein Centre. Um, and it's work in progress. So I'm not going to be reaching conclusions. Indeed, I should be trying to, to end this talk with, with a set of hypotheses where I suppose quantitative research would normally start. But instead, what, what I want to do is, is tell you some stories. To tell you some stories about what is perhaps to date the biggest story of this decade, COVID-19. And I want to encourage you to think about these stories and think about which of them is true, which of them is likely to be false. What should we believe about the stories that people are telling all the time? So perhaps I can get my machine to change. OK, I'm going to have to use my mouse rather than my keyboard to change slides. So that may require my finger to be a little more sensitive than it normally is. I guess most stories about COVID could begin something like, once upon a time, there was a city in the middle of China called Hubei that nobody had heard of. And there is, however, quite a lot of debate about whether the story did indeed start there. And, that's one of the stories that I want to explore over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. But I, I really want to begin by going a little further north to, to Beijing and, and to set not once upon a time, but a rather specific time, uh, which is the 20th of January 2020. Because on that day, 
a rather important event took place. Professor Yong spoke on main time television. Professor Yong uh, is 84 at the moment, he was 83 at the time, which gives me some hope of an extended career here in, in Beijing. He uh, did his postgraduate training at, at Barts and then at Edinburgh, but he is perhaps the most highly respected of all pulmonologists here in, in China. On mainstream, main time television, seven o'clock at night on the news, he announced that this unidentified, unnamed virus was probably transmissible from person to person. I want to shift further south. And five days later, to the, the city of Kuming, and to a, a mother and her daughter who were on holiday there. You remember, this is the new year time in, in China and the festival was sort of in, in full, full spring and, and they were there on, on holiday. On the 25th, the little girl in the middle of the night vomited. The following morning, her mum went to reception and asked they had a thermometer because her daughter had been falling in the night. 15 minutes later, the reception called her in the room and said, the police have been on the phone, you have to go to the hospital. The, the mum wondered about that. Why, the little girl, this was much better. 15 minutes later, the police called her mobile phone and said, are you on the way to the hospital? You're not. Do you want us to send the police car right away? She decided that, in fact, ah, that's quite interesting. Lots of little bad things go, go missing when you can't adjust your screen. I was hoping to be able to show you an image of, not any of, uh, oh, wait a minute, we. This is tricky. Not only of the city, which was the previous slide, <coughs> but also of the mother and child waiting for the taxi, which they decided it was probably wise to do. And eventually a taxi came and took them to a hospital and cut this story fairly short. She was tested at the hospital, sent home as being um, non-infectious, no disease, not quite clear what the, what the vomit was, but, but here's some medicine. Back at the hotel, five people signed the form, including the local police, to agree that she'd been to the hospital, that it was all negative, she was okay. And also, of course, to cover their backs. My reaction when I heard that story was, I suppose, possibly typical of my Western liberal upbringing. How dare the state intrude in family life in that way? And, and does a mother and child 1,600 kilometers away from Wuhan, which seemed to be a, a center of something or other, told to go to the hospital, and not only told to go, uh, but insist with a police car. And indeed, en route to the hospital, they were phoned again by the police to check that indeed uh, they were going to the hospital. And I, I wrote a blog. I was so cross. I asked, when else in history would the death of three unnamed urban residents within five days have materially reduced the individual freedoms of 1.4 billion people? I think it is a conundrum worth reflecting on, and it was at the time. My argument at the time was going to be that in some sense, the virus hadn't been invented, but it was being used to demonstrate the, the power of a, uh, of a Chinese society, uh, a, a social democratic society with Chinese characteristics. The image, the image went viral on the 4th of February. As you can see, it's quite a traditional Chinese image with the people wearing masks. And the graffiti on the bottom reads, wait for the warm flowers to bloom in spring. And then we can all go out to the streets without masks and enjoy flowers and company. Quite poetic. 
It was also prophetic, as we shall see in a moment. So what is my reaction now? Now that at least 125,000 people have died in the United Kingdom alone. In China, the epidemic peaked at 58,000 on the 15th of February. By the 22nd of April, it was the last time in which there were a thousand people recorded as being ill with the virus. It was the end of spring and the masks didn't come up until several months later, but life began to return to normal. China's death rate through COVID-19, as it's of course now called, is 3.46 per million. Less than 500, uh, or five, United Kingdom is 500 times, 520 or so times that figure. So what's my reaction now? Am I still appalled? No, I'm, I'm deeply embarrassed. I got it wrong. That blog was stupid. What do other people think about the way China has handled the epidemic? The Pew Research Center, a reputable center of the road organization in the United States, in 2019, conducted a survey, as you can see, across a range of countries, asking whether people took a favorable or an unfavorable view of China. And as you can see, for many of those countries, the majority of people took an unfavorable view. What did China's dealing with the pandemic do? It clearly made the situation worse, or at least the numbers of people taking an unfavorable view of China increased rather markedly over that period of time. The researchers concluded, analyzing their data, that perceptions of how well China had handled the virus colored people's overall view of the country and the regime as a whole. So if we look at the United Kingdom, of those who think that China has done a good job handling the epidemic, 59% took an unfavorable view of China. Still quite large, but of those who thought China did a bad job, 84% were in 2020 taking an unfavorable view of China. Well, what do we know? What do we know about the epidemic? The first person reporting as ill seems to have reported on the 8th of December, which probably means that the first symptoms emerged on the 1st of December. It's quite interesting, given the general view that the virus began uh, in the human seafood market, or that wet markets type stuff, to realize that that very first case seems as far as we can tell to have had no contact uh, with that um, at all. Um, I'm trying to put my watch on to make sure that I don't go on too long. I now feel comfortable. So we have, the first of our dilemmas, the story about it beginning at the market doesn't appear to be quite right. By the end of December, the National Health Commission had sent a team to Wuhan to investigate what was going on. And they began to recognize what, how to treat this new strange virus. On the 7th of January, Xi Jinping has been told, he's it seems to have taken over control, or at least that's what the media says, of controlling the epidemic at that point. By the 12th, the genome sequence had been identified and shared. When you think of the advances of science in just that time, we got some sort of understanding of what it looked like genetically. And then as we know, on the 20th of January, uh, we had the admit, an admission on television that human-to-human uh, -human transmission could take place. Along that timeline, it's fascinating to realize 
how few people were actually known to have had this, this new disease. 44 cases seemed to be ill when the World Health Organization was informed by the Chinese government. When China and the US uh, Centers for the Control of Disease started talking and working together, they had begun to identify a diagnosis, but there were only 41 people who were diagnosed. When the human to human transition was announced, we only knew of 198 cases. And then you see what happened by the 16th of February, when the joint expert team arrived in China to try and find out what the causes of this pandemic were. We had gone from 200 to 70,000 in the space of three weeks, massive explosion, which of course has been repeated in other parts of the world since. So what do we know from that first visit by the World Health Organization, led by, by the Canadian Bruce Arwood, and that first visit, which took place uh, in February, 2020? We know what is now obvious, that it was a new pathogen, that it was highly contagious, it spread quickly, and was considered capable of enormous health issues, economic and social impacts in, in any setting. And we have all personally, as societies and individuals, experienced all of that in the months that's happened subsequent. They also concluded that China had rolled out perhaps the most ambitious, agile, an aggressive disease containment effort in history. This is me again, that mother and daughter, 3,000 miles, 3,000 kilometers away from Beijing, who were told what to do just five days after it was announced that person to person contagion was possible. The report, the World Health Organization argued that exceptional coverage and adherence to the containment measures that have been implemented was only possible due to the deep commitment to the Chinese people to collective action in the face of this common threat. There's a bit of Chinese speak, I think, in the way that that is phrased, but it is rather different from the situation where people said, why should I wear a mask? Why indeed should I I'd even be vaccinated? Why should we close the economy down to save the lives of a few old people? As far as one can tell, that didn't happen here. China's bold approach to contain the rapid spread of this new pathogen has changed the course of a rapidly escalating and deadly epidemic. I guess, I guess that's fairly debatable. At the time, that report was hardly considered by the media. Subsequently, it was what President Trump used to demonstrate that China and the World Health Organization but working together, they were too close to each other. The World Health Organization was merely a lapdog of the Chinese government. And that's why he was going to pull China out from the World Health Organization. So those are the words that convinced President Trump not to back the World Health Organization. That was last, <laughs> that was last year. Work. This year, there's been a second visit by the World Health Organization to Wuhan and discussions about the origins of the epidemic. And we have, in a sense, a new story, a story that's considered by the BBC and media around the world, unlike being largely ignored a year ago. This is what the BBC said. Last month, the World Health Organization sent a team of experts to China to research the origins of the pandemic. But some members of the group have said China was uncooperative and withheld information about some of the first cases. The news from Peter Goffin reports. The researchers wanted raw data. Information on 174 coronavirus cases identified in the earliest days of the pandemic, in the city of Wuhan, where the outbreak is thought to have started. But Dr. Dominic Dwyer, an Australian infectious diseases expert, said Chinese officials refused to supply that basic data, instead offering up a summary of their findings. In the ideal world, you would go through it patient by patient by patient. If you want the details on 
you know, what were the questions asked, what were the responses, and what were the sort of analyses of the data. And that's standard practice for an outbreak investigation. Uh, in this situation, the Chinese gave us the results. We would have liked, I guess, to have seen the raw data. Dr. Dwyer said that information could still be forthcoming, and Beijing has insisted it was transparent with the WHO. But the team encountered roadblocks from the outset. Their arrival in China was delayed when Beijing was slow to approve their visas. The Danish epidemiologist, Dr. Thea Kultsen Fischer, who was part of the team, said she felt the entire trip was tinged by geopolitics. Some of the researchers say Chinese officials encouraged them to consider unproven claims that the virus originated outside China and was transmitted by frozen foods. Dr. Dwyer said there were disagreements between the WHO team and the Chinese scientists, but he played down their significance. In terms of discussion with Chinese colleagues, you know, they might be more firm about what the, what the data shows than we might have been. But, uh, you know, that's, that's natural. Uh, whether there's political pressure on people to have different opinions or not on the other side, I don't know. There may well be, but, you know, it's hard to know. Not all the researchers encountered problems. The British zoologist Dr. Peter Daschuk tweeted that as leader of the team's animal and environment working group, he found trust and openness with his Chinese counterparts. And he said he was given access to critical new data. Peter Goffin. So, I the story then of the second visit, Alan Ritson introducing that, that piece, China was uncooperative with how data. Peter Goffin. World Health Organization wanted raw data, Chinese refused. There were roadblocks all the way. They were slow with visas, tinged with geopolitics. The scientists were encouraged to consider unproven claims. And there were disagreements between the World Health Organization scientists and the Chinese ones. A negative reaction. It is possible to tell the story in a slightly different way. It might go something like this. Western scientists sent to Wuhan by the World Health Organization to investigate the origins of the pandemic found trust and openness despite the geopolitical pressures that surrounded the trip. While there were inevitably scientific disagreements, they were given critical new data and encouraged to examine novel hypotheses about the origin of the pandemic. Having been shown analysis of the early stages of the pandemic, the World Health Organization scientists are now hoping to obtain information on individual patients, despite issues of confidentiality. Two stories. China was obstructive, it was open. China refused data, China shared data. China made false claims, offered suggestions. The scientists disagreed, they discussed. China played politics. China was subject to politics. Scientists left discontented. The scientists left contented. How did I turn it round in quite that way? Well, instead of using unsubstantiated claim, I substituted novel hypotheses. And whoops, and I added despite issues of confidentiality which was in the original material that Peter used, but not carried onto air. So, what do we learn? Oh, where is it my house? Ah, here we are. We learn it's elusive, of course. Moment, Are people still able to hear me or has the line gone down? You have frozen for me. It's frozen, Robert. Frozen. Well, I haven't. I have frozen. You have frozen. Okay, and my screen is we can still hear. We can still hear you. Okay, I'm going to 
Ouais. Robert, perhaps if you turn the camera off, because I think we can all still hear you. I think he's popped out. OK. Um, I've lost him from my list. Is that you're not, and as Jeremy said, at least he's, he's not turned into a cat. He has um, not turned into a cat. <laughs> I promise I didn't uh, Jackie weave for him. While we're waiting for Robert to get back in or um, someone to contact him perhaps to help him do that with another device can um could we take sh should we just take a, a five minute break Yes, we've had some thumbs up for that, Judy. Yes, um, so it's uh, it's twelve twenty eight. If if we could reconvene at twelve thirty five, please, um, and we'll we'll see what we can do to reconnect Robert. I'll just put that in the chat as well. Um, do we have a phone number for Robert, Lucy? Um, no, I didn't think to take one. Let me turn my video um, on and remove you from Spotlight. Hang on. Um, I didn't think to, to take one, but I haven't had an email saying there's a problem. So perhaps he's just... He's just trying to get back in again. Well, we'll just yeah. give it five minutes and, uh, uh, and it's... Uh, However much one practices these things, there's no accounting for last minute technology mess ups or somebody starting scaffolding next door or all the other things that can interrupt Absolutely. the most well planned lecture. <laughs> he was in full flow as well. That's a shame. I know. I was really enjoying it. I know. I was kind of in the in the in the flow of the, the narrative there. But we'll we'll just give him five minutes and then hope. There's a reconnection. In the meantime, this is the point where in real life you'd chat to your neighbour, isn't it? Here we are, he's back. Is he? Okay, I'll just say we're just waiting a couple of minutes and had, had, if, he, if he can, if he doesn't mind waiting a couple of minutes while um, other people come Sorry. back in. We'll just have to Robert, are you back with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Lovely. My apologies for that, folks. Um, we've, uh, I shall speed up so that we no, don't... Robert, we've, ju we've just told people to come back, uh, to come back in a, a couple of minutes. We just did a quick five-minute break in case okay. it... So, yeah, I, I'm really sorry. You were in the middle of a, 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 a we were all caught up in the narrative and then. <laughs> and then the connection let us down. Oh, I'm not sure what it was. My whole machine froze, which is very unusual. Mm. Um, so I had to reboot and come back in again. Um, but uh, at least I'm back. OK, what a pity. We will um, have to... Uh, Speed up just a little bit, and I'll try and not um, miss too much out. 
Thank you. So, sorry about that. We were just saying, however well one plans um, plans it and t tests the technology, there is no accounting for what ends up interrupting things. No, it's wonderful when it works and a pain when it doesn't. Yes. Yeah, but if you wouldn't mind just waiting a minute or two since we, we did say to people, rather than yeah. having everyone hanging Quite around with that. How many come back? <laughs> Although are most people, it's hard to know whether people are here, here, or... Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> but if we just give a, a minute or two, and you can... Uh... <laughs> some people are... Thank you, Jeremy. We know some people are here. Is this being live streamed on YouTube at the same time or is yes. it get edited? Okay, it so it's, people can skip through the gap, can't they? Okay. Um, Robert, are you okay to start again? Yeah. And I'll just welcome everyone back and sorry, um, Sorry, there wasn't ice cream in the intermission, folks, um, but we'll pass now back to Robert just to, to continue his talk. Thank you, Robert. Pleasure. I apologise for that. We could say it's Chinese censorship, perhaps. I suspect not. So what we were concluding was that the truth is elusive. We've got two stories based around the same set of facts. And as I said right at the beginning, I'm sharing a series of stories with you in this lecture and encouraging you to think which approximate to the truth and which don't. Robert, you favorite. haven't reshared your screen, sorry to interrupt. My screen isn't shared? No. It appears to be from my image. Hmm. Has it, fro it kind of frozen again, surely? No, I haven't got anything on my screen. Has anyone else got? No. Um, it isn't currently sharing. Do you want to just no. try sharing again, Robert? You want to try stop sharing and then resharing? No. Okay. I. Apologies once more. Are we any better? I can see the screen again there, and that seems to be back. So, okay. Well, let us hope we can get to the end of the story. <laughs> Thank you very um, much. As I was saying, I tried to tell stories. Some of them work and some of them don't work. But the point is that, that news is not just news. News is a product. It's a product for sale in many senses. Newspapers are bought. The BBC, which is so important as an institution within the United Kingdom, this obviously has to be paid for. And in the case of the uh, World Service, from which I took that article or that item, it's obviously funded by the Parliament Commonwealth and Development Office. Within that context, 
the BBC is not allowed to express its own editorial opinion about current affairs and matters of, of public policy. It is constrained to do so. But essentially, there is news. There's false news, news which doesn't appear to be accurate, and then there's fake news, perhaps. News that is deliberately intended not to be correct. It's like a tour story to go alongside the other stories that are being told. Really what I'm talking about is media bias. The bias of the media is that convey the stories between other parts of the world and us as consumers of that news. Media bias is typically defined as something like unjustifiable favoritism. It provides an inaccurate and an unbalanced and unfair view of the world. And of course, there are lots of different types of bias, spin and slant and omission and mechanisms for achieving that through your choice of words and for your placement of words. So let's go back to the newsroom. Let's go back to that radio item and think about it in the context, therefore, uh, of bias. It went out on a, on a Saturday, Sunday evening. There was limited news around, which is probably, uh, possibly, why that item was carried at all. You remember the scientists wanted raw data? Wanted is a strong word, and asked for they wanted it. So raw data speaks in some sort of way that it's different from data generally. Officials refused. Refused is a strong verb. Officials were well, none of us like officials. And then if we put Chinese in front of them, and we know what China's like, degree of negativity. And the entire trip, not just the trip, the entire trip was tinged with geopolitics. It becomes a story, it becomes somewhat exciting. What's going on here? What's China doing? And then slant, emphasizing one side of the story. The Chinese officials refused to supply that basic data. They could have said, was not was given access to critical new data which is what I said in, in my retelling of the story. Beijing has insisted that it was transparent with the World Health Organization, insisted, implying that it probably wasn't, that's why it had to insist. And as we'd heard before, of course, the team encountered roadblocks. Roadblocks from the outset, from the very beginning, the whole thing. Not all. Researchers encountered problems. Two were cited, the team was about 13. But nevertheless, a statement that not all, or not all. So what do we take from that? Well, we saw there was another form of, of bias which comes from omission. Remember the reference to Thea Fisher, who said that she thought that the entire trip was tinged with geopolitics. That's where it came from. It didn't come from Peter uh, as their correspondent. He was citing Tia Fisher. But what she said was the entire trip was tinged with geopolitics. Everybody knows how much pressure there is on China to be open to an investigation, which I feel changes the, complex, the complexion of that notion of tinge with geopolitics. It pushes the emphasis to the fact that China is under pressure to be open. And indeed, eight hours earlier, Tia Fisher had tweeted that her quotes, or our quotes, she was talking about the whole team, are, intended, are intendedly twisted, casting shadows over important scientific work. The people who were on this visit were scientists of the highest order. Um, and their work, important work, she claims, was being twisted. Word crafting. Well, we've talked a little bit about that in my storytelling. Unsubstantiated claim, which I substituted with a hypothesis, an idea. It was really about the notion that the, epi that the epidemic began outside of China. This notion of wanted rather than would have, looked, would have liked to have raw data. And, and, the, and the disagreements. He, Peter said that the scientists played down their significance. He could have said the disagreements were insignificant 
rather than play down, which implied that they were indeed significant. And Peter Daszak's entirely positive take on the entire trip was placed at the end after the presentation of all the disagreements and the negatives. Disagreements came before play down, and uh, we have Peter Daszak again complaining uh, that the journalists were distorting key findings of their exhausting month lot work. Our colleagues are selectively misquoted to fit a narrative that was prescribed before the work began. I guess that's a reference back to what Tia was saying in terms of this political nature of the whole exercise. And again, this notion of officials refused, but the information could still be forthcoming. So, false news, fake news, was it the truth? Well, let's think about what counts as bias. Alden Williams wrote a, a great text on this and argued that to count as bias, inaccurate reporting, inaccurate storytelling has to be sustained and intentional. Sustained? Well, certainly I think if it's sustained, it must be worse. You're constantly being told the wrong thing. If it's less sustained, you only hear one news broadcast, it still, of course, can be misleading and intentional. I will use the word fake news as intentionally biased. I would use the term false news as inaccurate. And when I described this lecture for its promotion, I used the word false news rather than fake news. I want, as we go on, to See if we can pull apart, distinguish between fake and false. What are the sources of false news then? How does it come about? Well, particularly when you're talking about international affairs, you're going from one culture to another. How well do we understand it? There's lots of bias that could come about for non-deliberate reasons, inadvertent bias. Not all journalists are necessarily that good. Not all journalists can hide their values or want to, to fit in play with the BBC's notion of independence. They may not be that professionally competent. And of course, they're under pressure. They're under pressure to take boring stories which don't sell newspapers and people don't listen to. They need to sell news they have to get high ratings. They have to turn news into something that we want to hear, that we want to tune in, to learn about. So let's go back to the newsroom and see what we know there. It was clearly an international story. And if you're telling an international story, you actually have to translate it, not just the words, of course, but the cultural context in which it took place. And the longer I live in China, the more I realize how different Chinese society is. For instance, this concept of face in China. Face is central. I lost one of my best friends, my best academic colleagues in the first project I did on in China 10 years ago by suggesting that I didn't really agree with her research conclusions. Living in China, I realize you never do that. Chinese politeness forbids direct criticism. To lose face is to be so humiliating it's beyond belief. In seminars and in science in China, direct criticism is very rare. Therefore, if Western scientists went in without realizing that, as I was 10 years ago, those conversations, those discussions could be very heated. The journalists might be right, although the, the scholars themselves um, downplayed them. There's a Chinese saying, too, that everything in China is difficult, uh, but everything is possible. So those delays, uh, delays in visa applications would be seen as a norm as would the initial reluctance to provide information. It's, it's just different. You get information in different ways. It's not just about asking, it's about who you ask and in what context. 
And of course, there are big ideological differences. In fact, we have a globe that's perhaps moving apart along that ideological fault line. Shepherding by officials here is actually normal. Party officials are active in all aspects of Chinese life. As an academic, I report to my head of department, but I report equally to the party official who is responsible for the activities of our department too. As to a Westerner to coming here, that sounds horrendous, horrible. But officials are generally seen as benevolent. They may not be competent and that may be questioned, but they're generally not seen as threatening. To us in the West, I guess they often are. But think of the difficult job that journalists do. They typically have to cover a range of topics. I've already emphasized that the copy they produce needs to be newsworthy, but it has to be done quickly. They have to write simply for the general audience, succinctly get the message across up front if they can. They have to, on television, on radio, to perform as if they know what they're talking about. And those arguments need to be well balanced. And all of that leads to a whole series of risks of different sorts of bias. Concision bias, over simple stories. Mainstream bias, borrowing the stories of other people and telling them again, what we might call plagiarism. Sensationalism, come and listen to this story, it's important. Path dependency, you know and I know what we really think. Let's tell the story again. Speculation, unevidenced assertion, and tonality, the way we tell the story. So back to the newsroom item. Peter Goffin, we learn from his acting editor, uh, was a duty reporter on the day. Paul explained that he was neither a specialist on China nor on COVID-19. It would be quite difficult then for him to nuance those cultural subtleties in translating the story from a Chinese world to a Western world. Paul Day Bush said that the starting point of the story was an audio by Dominic Dwyer. We heard him go to that and you heard Dominic talking and it was he who was talking about whether they'd got evidence or not. In fact, that video, well, that audio was released as a video by Reuters. And as you can see in this uh, news, news, news item for Reuters spread around the news industry, we have words that we already begin to think about. So China refused to provide the team with raw data on the early COVID cases. So we can begin to see where Peter got his story from. And here's the Dwyer recording, which is included in the Reuters thing, which we hear uh, um, Dwyer talking uh, verbally. We don't actually see the video. In the ideal world, you would go through, this is the data, patient by patient by patient. In this situation, they gave us the results we would have liked, I, I guess. I guess. No, sorry, I'll read that again because it's important on the emphasis. In this situation, they gave us the results. We would have liked, I guess, to have seen the raw data, but that can still come. The intonation shifts away from refusing to the fact that they're still in the process of negotiating this data and getting this data. I guess we would have liked to have seen it. What we saw was the analysis. What we saw, if you like, as academics, is the, is the published work and being taken through the analytic process, but we didn't get person-to-person -person data, at least not all of it. Goffin appears also to have drawn on another piece that was published in the New York Times the day earlier, and that's where he got the quote from Dr. Fisher. He removed, as we've already seen, that last part of the quote, so he took, if you like, the newsworthy sexy bit and dropped the qualification. There is no evidence that I can find that Peter actually went to a fuller item, which again, China refuses raw data, which was published in the Wall Street Journal. So duty reporter of the day needing to give a piece 
gets hold of readily available data and repeats it as an item. It seems to me that there's prima facie evidence there for cultural bias, shortening concision bias, following what others were doing, mainstream bias, or if you like, plagiarism, sensationalizing it, path dependency. What would you expect the Chinese to do? Surely they're bound to refuse. Now, all of that could be inadvertent. Peter was working under pressure. He needed to get his copy to the editor. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to ask him about the decisions that were taken. He was really happy to talk to me, but he was editor sold him and he wasn't allowed to. So we don't know the extent to which uh, the evidence, why he took the decisions that he did. So the hypothesis at the moment is, is that's probably false news, probably the pressure that Peter was working under. But I want to take us on a little bit further because the story continues. Ned Price, US State Department, in a rather long um, press um, gathering, talked about, was asked several questions about the World Health Organization's visit. And he said, we look forward again to seeing the report, to using our own intelligence and analysis to corroborate what the World Health Organization has found. In many ways, it was low key. Well, the report can come, but basically the CIA, our intelligence, is what we're going to rely on to find out what the causes of the pandemic were. However, that prompted Peter Danzak, the zoologist, British zoologist, although he's now based in the United States, to tweet. He's a scientist. Uh, the US State Department said we don't care about the scientists, we're going to use our, our intelligence sources. He was arguing that, Peter was arguing that this is political, Joe Biden has to look tough on China. It's part of the need to, in some sense, to, to balance the, the era of Trump. Please don't rely too much on US intelligence, so they're increasingly disengaged under the Trump era. And frankly, they were wrong in many respects. So a rather low-key statement repeatedly saying we're not too worried about the World Health Organization was followed by a scientist who felt offended their work was going to be wasted. On the 13th, something like four or five days later, the White House, in fact at Camp David, it was over the weekend, uh, President Biden got his national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, there and they were discussing what Senior politicians discuss uh, at Camp David. Never been there, wonder what they do discuss. Anyway, they issued a statement. We have deep concerns about the way in which the early findings of the COVID-19 investigation were communicated. It is imperative that they are free from intervention or alteration by the Chinese government. China must make available this data. It's a, it's, a, it's a very substantial change in tone uh, from the Biden administration over those four days. Was it Peter's intervention? I suspect not, but what could have happened was the two articles in the New York Times and on CNN. China scores a public relations win after World Health Organization to mission to Wuhan. It's become clearly political. It's the international competition, the New York Times said, and China is winning it. The CNN effectively agreed. China seizes on the lack of the World Health Organization breakthrough to determine precisely what the result is, to claim that uh, the virus perhaps didn't come from Wuhan, that the, the case was still open. A diplomatic victory, therefore, for China. And it's true, China did just that. The Global Times took up the idea that, the old Trump idea that was being presented that it escaped from the laboratory within Wuhan is extremely unlikely. That's essentially what the official, what, what the scientists said on, the, on, on ending their visit. Equally, the idea that China has that the virus, we shouldn't just look in China, for example, we know that there was virus president in, in Italy in November 2019. The story 
was taken up most definitely by the Chinese. We know bits of the story. We know now what happened subsequently. We've looked at the New York Times, which Peter used, and the Reuters document, and the newsroom uh, item, which is essentially where we began. But there's another twist to this story that I want to introduce you to. Before noting that China didn't like the New York Times uh, article at all, arguing that they were misquoted, or rather, they quoted the scientists who were saying they are misquoted. So those tweets found their way into the hands of the Chinese and were used in Chinese media. Xinhua, which is the main official news uh, organization in China, was very explicit. The New York Times should stop distorting facts to suit its own anti-China agenda. But the story, takes a twist on the Sunday morning, and hopefully we will be able to hear it. And I'm joined now by the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, who, judging by his wallpaper, is inside the Foreign Office. Mr. Raab, you'll have heard that interview with Professor Watts. The um, US administration, Mr. Biden's administration, are profoundly worried about the WHO investigation into China. Are you, are you as well? Are you concerned? Well, I think it's important they were able to make that first visit. We do share concerns that they get full cooperation and they get the answers they need. Um, so we'll be pushing for, uh, uh, for it to have full access, get all the data it needs to be able to answer the questions that I think most people want to hear answered around the outbreak, the causes. And that's important, not for uh, geopolitical point scoring or anything like that, but so we can learn the lessons and prevent it ever happening again. Coming okay. closer to her. So we heard Andrew Moore's question. The US administration, Mr. Biden's administration, are profoundly worried about the World Health Organization investigation into China. Are you as well? Are you concerned? The Foreign Secretary replied, well, it is important that they were able to make that first visit. And we do share concerns that they get full cooperation and they get the answers that they need. A leading question, those of us who are social scientists would say, but the Foreign Secretary replied in a way which was very measured. It doesn't allocate blame, it says, we're pleased that they were there and they got that visit and we share concerns that they get full cooperation. Reuters takes this response and turns it into a foreign policy statement. What you saw there was the creation of British foreign policy stimulated by Andrew Moore. So words are straight within the Reuters. UK says it shares US concerns. Uh, that's the word that the Foreign Secretary used over COVID-19. British Foreign Minister Dominic Raab said he shared concerns about the level of access given to the World Health Organization COVID-19's fact-finding mission to China almost word for word, echoing criticism from the United States. Well, in a way, perhaps, I didn't hear any criticism in what the Foreign Secretary was saying, but here we have Reuters saying that the United Kingdom is joining the United States in criticizing China. Interesting, who makes news and here, who makes Britain's foreign policy? When Andrew Marr was introducing uh, Dominic well, to, to, the, to the public and saying, hello, I notice your wallpaper, you must be in the Foreign Office, he sort of swallowed his words. He said, you would have had an interview with Professor, I think he may have forgotten his name. The professor was John Watson. As you can see on the right hand side, John Watson is a person who is an outstanding epidemiologist who was part of the World Health Organization team. All the members of the team had the sorts of qualifications that John Watson has. And here we have a situation where an, an academic had 18, and I had 16 minutes on the Andrew Marr show. It's very rare for academics to have that amount of time. And I hope John Watson won't be offended 
but it was boring television. It was boring television, but it was fascinating television too, if you were looking at what was being tried and what wasn't happening. If you look at the screen, you can see some of the familiar names, Dominic Dwyer and Jake Sullivan. Whether Moore was using the BBC's programme or relying on the Reuters press release, it's not clear. But Ma said, well, Ma asked, did you see the raw data about the 174 people who contracted coronavirus in, in China? Because a lot of people have said that that was essential. Watson replies, we saw a very great deal about specifically those 174 people. This is just the start of the process. Not really what Ma wanted. Ma was seeking to have some good hard points that he could put in front of the foreign secretary. We go on, 16 minutes, I've transcribed some of it, but I just want you to, in a sense, go down to where Ma says, your team came up with four different possible scenarios. What is the most likely of these? These are scenarios for the beginning of the, of the epidemic. Um, essentially, this notion of was it outside of China? What, what precisely was it? Watson, using his, his expertise as the epidemiologist, gives an account of what he thinks is the most likely story. The probability is that there are an animal reservoir somewhere and that the infection got to humans, so an intermediary host that is more plentiful. That, we think is the most likely. Listen to Ma's comment at the end of being told, it's an animal reservoir. So, to be absolutely clear, the possibility that this escape from one of the two big research institutes and laboratories is not ruled out. Watson hadn't mentioned that. Watson's reply is, no, it's not ruled out. That is correct. But it's clearly not what Watson thinks. I think Watson is talking about the whole team, then it's this animal reservoir. says, are you personally absolutely sure that this started in China? In other words, are you absolutely sure that what China may be saying, that it came from outside, is not true? Are you personally absolutely sure that this started in China? Watson, no. Ma didn't get the leads that he wanted to screw a stronger response out of uh, the foreign secretary. I asked the question, whose role is it to make foreign policy? Is it the role of our elected representatives? What is it the role of journalists? We go on a little bit. We've seen the Andrew Ma show. We've seen policy making perhaps being made. We've seen what Reuters took uh, uh, from that, this notion of echoing criticism of, of the United States. Not quite at the end of the story, but almost. Boris has to be part of the story, doesn't he? And he is. He appeared the following morning on the CBS News on their Face the Nation programme. And of course, we're in the United States rather than in Britain, so there's much less respect for politicians and prime ministers than you would expect, uh, the, the expect to find on the BBC or the ITV. You have not met President Biden yet. Back in 2019, he referred to you, as I'm sure you'll know, as a physical and emotional clone of Donald Trump. Are you concerned you're going to start off on the wrong foot? Wow, what an introduction to our Prime Minister. Quite a lengthy interview, I think about 15 minutes, in which Boris thought he needed to get on the right foot of President Biden. And, oops, as the CBS News says, Boris Johnson agrees with Biden that China should hand over all the data about its COVID-19 cases to the World Health Organization. So what we are seeing, I guess, is the connections which lead to the broadcasts that we take as news, the stories that are told to us through the media. And here we have the fascinating situation where the media appears 
to be helping the British government to make its foreign policy. So the British government is closing up, uh, nudging up towards the American jurisdiction, so the American politicians, through the stories that are told, the, the situations that they are placed on television. An international alliance being built against China, who is refusing to give data, but not according, of course, to the scientists who were present in that process. So what can we believe about COVID-19? Can we believe the World Health Organization analysis of the origins when it is published? They were going to publish an interim report, but they've decided to wait and publish a full report rather than an interim one. So we don't yet know. But we should believe it according to the scientists who were involved. No, we shouldn't, according to the Western mainstream media. Can we trust that mainstream media to be accurate and fair? I think certainly not all of it. I think some of the material that I have presented and shared with you doesn't look that fair. And this is where I'm moving on to hypotheses for the remainder of the research I'm trying to do. My hypothesis is it's more likely to be accurate than fair. So the facts will be there, but the matrix in which those facts are embedded may not be as fair as it ought to be. Does the mainstream media generate false news? i.e. news which is deliberately untrue. I'm sorry, I'll start again. Uh, generate false news, news that is just incorrect, inaccurate. And I think, yes, it does, and I think we've seen that, and it can be for cultural or structural reasons, it can be unintended. This is the bit where we're on to fake news, and where it's intentional. And my hypothesis here is a provisional yes, but I've got to find a lot more evidence before I'm prepared to support that. There are other questions that need to be asked. Is it the newsmakers, the politicians, the people who are being reported who are generating this fake news? And are they deliberately creating it? Is it fake or is it even false? Do they misunderstand the situation? Or is it deliberately fake? Or are some journalists deliberately creating fake news? What was the New York Times doing in using and emphasizing this, this word of refuse and, 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 and uh, with a particular type of data, raw data? Are journalists complicit in creating this fake news? Are they aware of what they're doing? Do they know? And are newsmakers and journalists totally unaware of creating fake news, which would really make it false news? So I need to come up with some answers to those hypotheses. And finally, did the pandemic turn world opinion further against China? We began by saying, I was shocked at the beginning, thought China was doing entirely the wrong thing. Now faced with the facts, now having a whole year in China post COVID, where I haven't been condemned and trapped as you have been, I took a different view. But my hypothesis is that the pandemic didn't really turn world opinion much against China. It had already turned in the previous year, 2018 to 19. Look at the graphs going up, and they continue going up during the period of the COVID pandemic. So something else is happening. Public opinion versus China over the last five years has moved from the majority supporting China to the majority moving against. So my hypothesis now is that people's unfavorable view of China caused them to believe that China handled the COVID epidemic poorly or badly. In other words, the reverse of what the Pew report was saying. And there's the reverse analysis. 59% of those who take an unfavorable view of China thought they did a bad job handling the epidemic. Cause and effect, same data, it's not 
It's not, uh, it's not longitudinal, therefore we can't check time, but it's my hypothesis that that's the way that it's going. And my third hypothesis is that these unfavorable views of China stem partly from false and fake news, partly from the story that I have taken you through today. So lots of stories, stories about where COVID came from, this disease, this infection that changed all our lives. Lots of stories. What do you believe? What should we believe? Will we ever know the truth? Thank you. Robert, thank you hugely. Um, that was, um, I, I, I give people a moment to, to do their reactions or unmute and clap if, they're, if they can do it. But thank you so much for that talk. If, did you want to risk trying to put your camera back on for Q&A or, or might that Well, let's try. Up? Let's try. So we can see you. Thank you so much for that um, and, and for rescuing yourself after, after the interruption. And, and I really like that careful explication of, of news and, and your comment that, that it might be more accurate than fair and, and how, how those, um, those, that news coverage has, has, has turned over the past year. I'll give people a couple of minutes to gather their thoughts and pop questions in the, in the chat. But perhaps while people are doing that, I can abuse my chair's privilege because I, I, I kind of had a, a number of questions through that. And I, I really enjoyed the way you had unpacked those stories for us. It was, it, it was fascinating. But I, I, just to kind of, your question about how you distinguish the sort of fairness from the fakeness, I guess, is a, is, is a key thing for me. And, um, one might argue that you know the, the media's job is is not to be um, to, to reproduce scientific uh, consensus for us. It, it it is to kind of create stories that people attach to and 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 make things meaningful for people. And in doing that, there'll inevitably be some kind of turning of um, of what was said. And whether you feel that's fair or not might very much depend on which side you are. But I just wondered whether whether you could you can say anything at this point about a, a kind of a more normative question, what you think the media's role ought to be in reporting this, given that I, I'm, I'm assuming you're, you know, the, the idea of a kind of perfect truth, given that all the uncertainties and everything else is, is probably not possible. And there is this role in creating stories, but, but where, where does the kind of moral um, responsibility of mainstream media lie in reporting, uh, uh, and this, of course, is the most pressing example that we've got. But, but what applies to COVID might apply to other things. Well, as social scientists, we see reality as being created; it's being constructed, and many others do anyway. If we're philosophers, we challenge a notion of truth. Journalism doesn't. Journalism says its job is to reveal the truth, to tell true stories. So it seems to me that the role of journalism is to tell true stories to the best of their ability. So traditionally, for example, in American media, news is nominally presented straight. An opinion is placed in other pages in American broadsheet newspapers. That very rarely happens in British newspapers. It's, it's put together. The, the public sector broadcasters obviously have a different uh, responsibility. They're meant to produce, um, well, you see, I think, I think the notion of truth, <laughs> I'm a realist ultimately, I think there is a truth, it's hellishly difficult to get to, and I've spent my life trying to get to it, and I wouldn't claim my heart, but I think it's something fair. You use the word fairness, and I think fairness takes you straight to ideology. And yes, we are human beings, we are ideological, we shape our understanding. Facts take their meaning by embedded, being embedded in something. In science, they're embedded in theory and hypotheses. In everyday life, maybe that embedded in ideology and prejudice. It strikes me that journalists should be cutting through that, and insofar as they can, 
to live up to their code, which is to tell, tell the truth. Um, so, fair, so I use false as being inaccurate, and I use the term fake as being deliberately inaccurate. I will forgive journalists for being inaccurate, for producing false news. I would encourage them to try harder not to, but I recognize that they're working under enormous pressure. I would challenge them about the nature of producing fake news. I think that is abusing their role within society. I'm muted, sorry, I've done it. And there is um, a question from Virginia Gagnia. Do, do you want to just unmute and go for it? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I liked your lecture very much. Um, I think it's hugely important work that you're doing. I have two questions. The first one is, do you think this is all going to be exacerbated by the new private media that they're, that they're bringing um, to supplement, as it were, the BBC in the UK? Um, more news like Fox News stations are now coming into the UK. Will that make this much worse? And my second question is, do you think that vis-a-vis -vis the PRC specifically, um, that this, what you're showing about COVID is probably true in other stories about the PRC, like the Uyghur in Xinjiang and the rest? Is this a general way now that the PRC is being treated? Thank you very much. Thank you, they're, they're good questions. And thank you for your, your kind comments. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm not a fan of the private media in that sense. Um, you know, we know about stereotypes. We all live within stereotypes. Stereotypes are, in, are exaggerated when we don't speak to the people who are at the other end of the stereotyping. We, cognitive dissonance, we like to hear what we believe already. You know, we choose our friends because they have similar interests. It's a natural human instinct. But I think it's incredibly dangerous uh, for having, well, particularly when, when news, to go back to the, the question that Judy asked, really, when the news transmutes into opinion. I think journalism, I, by all means, comment on the facts, by all means, uh, have a Fox News, but it would be great if the news itself could be presented in a way which was not contaminated by the ideology, and then the ideology interprets it in a way that you know, supports policy objectives or, or beliefs. It's ideal. I'm an idealist, let's face it. But I am profoundly worried about what I have found. And I'm not interested in this by being in China, by listening and getting increasingly cross with the Western media that is describing my life as I experience it. Clearly, one individual in Beijing who can hardly speak or can not speak no Mandarin. But I don't see often the world that is presented. So the Xinjiang, I've, I've put in a bid to go. I'm desperate to go to the province to see if it's possible to find out a little bit more. I'm, you know, I'm not an investigative journalist, I'm a researcher. I'm fascinated by the culture in which I live and I'm fascinated by the distance between my culture and the Chinese culture. Workfare in America, in order to receive benefits, you have to work. That strikes me as a form of forced labor. It is possible to reinterpret in part, what is happening in Xinjiang as a form of workfare, as a form of engaging people within the labour market. I'm not saying that's what the case, case is the case, and I don't know whether there is um, systematic um, imprisonment in the way that is being described. I have begun to look at that. And I haven't found a source of information which I can't track back to some part of the right wing American funding organizations. It may be released from Germany, it may be released from Belgium, 
And I'm not an investigative journalist, and I haven't focused on that. I focused on something much simpler. But I worry about it. I worry about it because I think the foreign, the, the, the new white paper on all the new plans on British foreign policy are very interesting. They're saying, um, and this we released this week, they're walking this tightrope between, we don't agree with China, but we have to work with them because they're a blooming great economy and we need to sell our goods. And if we're going to cope with global wide issues, we have to work with partnership with them. And I'm very much committed to the notion of global governance and that we have to work together. What I'm increasingly appalled by is the notion that if they share our values, we will work with them, and if they don't, we won't. It's not clear to me that there's only one set of values that a society can work within. I personally don't quite understand why it's so dreadful for the government to tax and to invest in companies that turn those taxes into goods. It's not approved of by for the United States, for example, which believes that's much better done by the private sector, not by government. Those are two different ways of addressing the well-being of the people. I would like to accept multiple systems and working together. And I think the discourse that is happening is making that increasingly likely. It's pushing the two sides into ghettos that don't talk to each other, they talk about each other, and they don't listen, they preach. Thank you, Robert. And it is, it's just interesting hearing your perspective on what happens when you literally just shift to another position and, and look at things. That's, um, can I, Jeremy, you've had your hand up. Would you like to come in? Oh, I'd I love to. Thanks. Thanks so much, Judy. Um, uh, Robert, thank, thank you for this talk. It, it's, it's very stimulating. And I, I have a number of questions for you. I'm a, my, I'm, my name is Jeremy Green. I'm a historian of medicine here at Johns Hopkins. Very interesting intersection of science, uh, media and medicine. And I've learned a lot in this talk. I, I'd like to ask you to expand on it a little bit as much as you're willing um, in your, your central principles beyond the instance of the specific question of, of Chinese, uh, of access to Chinese data um, to broader concerns of the mediation's effect in the COVID pandemic. Um, and also how much you're willing to use this to push this analysis from, if I'm reading it correctly, there, there are scientists doing work um, producing truth and then media who are imperfectly disseminating these truths um, to, to actually lean a bit more on the production of scientific truth itself. So there's some parallels I want to draw between what, um, what happens in, in journalism and what happens in science. So much of the professionalization of the field of journalism in the 20th century is based on this principle of distinguishing fact from opinion, which you've illustrated is not really distinguishable in the accounts that you're looking at. Um, but scientists in training also learn to separate observations from analysis. And historians, sociologists of science have suggested that that separation is not as pure as we would like it to be either. Both fields emphasize third person writing as a literary technique that helps to construct the appearance that the world of things is just writing itself onto pages of either newspaper or scientific journals in passive form, right? Without the tainting bias of the subjective author, which we know is there. Both rely on modes of gatekeeping before putative facts and formation are published. Major newspapers have extensive fact checking protocols to enhance accuracy, as you're saying, and scientific journals have the peer review process, which again, got compromised in many ways during the urgency of fact formation in the early pandemic. Um, and so I, I guess where I'm going is I, I'd love to know your guidance because only a naive reader believes everything they read in the newspaper, but only a fool believes a newspaper contains nothing of importance. And only a naive realist believes scientific knowledge captures the unvarnished truth of the universe, but only a fool believes that science is merely a theory. And so where would you take us into how we think about therapeutic discrepancies about hydroxychloroquine, about vaccine hesitancy, about, um, you know, using vaccines that are approved through and through emergency use authorizations, knowing that we've had to abrogate the full process that regulatory bodies go through because of the emergency. How do you extend it? Well, those are really important issues. And I like, I like very much the parallel between journalism and the research industry. And I think we all know when we write, we're telling a story, you know, even when we're thinking about which journal we go to, 
we look up the editor, we look up what that journal is referring to, we cite their articles to enhance our, enhance our, our chance of, of getting included. We know Robert Merton's work on the Matthew effect, uh, that, that, that known scientists become great scientists because they're known, and there's known scientists never make it. That's that cumulative effect. Um, I, I, think, I think we do, I, I, I aspire to a scientific process. One of the things I, I find difficult reading much American scholarship is that it, it seems to be premised on, here's an assumption which I wish to demonstrate the validity of. I think European science, or at least that's what happens when I was in Oxford and we had lots of American students come across. They had been taught to write essays in that way. The way we try to teach people to write essays in Oxford was very much assemble the evidence on the balance of probabilities. What do you conclude in relation to the question that you're asking? Now, the balance of probabilities, of course, is interesting, and that's difficult in itself. But it also linked to that. I'm a qualitative and quantitative researcher. I don't reject either mode, and I like to put them together. But the quantitative one, theoretically at least, is you reduce the probability of falseness by stating a hypothesis at the beginning. Um, you know how to interpret your results. If you find your results, as you say, we can all interpret them. And that's what journalism is very much about. So it's that process of interpreting. Uh, and in that case, of course, values are, are very central, central to the core. Um, so I think, so, I think, well, we know sociology of science tells us that, you know, we do science because we want to chair. Um, uh, we want to reach the top of our discipline. Uh, what's the best way of reaching the top of our discipline? But equally, I think many of us are actually committed to learning. Uh, and, we, and we do have some sort of notion of what's much more true, best true. And, and that's what we're seeking to do. And that's why methodology and transparency in methodology is so critical. So we have a method section. We don't have a method section in a newspaper. I wouldn't want a method section in a newspaper. But we have no way of checking. Uh, and so that makes it difficult. And only fools don't believe everything in a newspaper. I respect your positive view of person kind. Uh, I think sociology tells us quite a lot different from that. It tells us that we have an affirmative bias, that we're more inclined to believe what we want to believe than to accept what we don't want to accept. I think we get punch drunk. I think if every time you turn on the BBC, you're told that China is an enemy, that China is, is not only developing or catching up, but China is a work pile that has to be dealt with. If you're told that time and time again, and nobody's telling you the opposite story, and likewise, if you're looking at it in terms of America told from, told from China, China is ridiculous in my view. Well, yeah, China is in some senses ridiculous. You know, I have to be careful in terms of what I say. I'm conscious of that. Debates in science in China are difficult in that sense. But China challenges every stupid comment the Western media makes. We know how to keep a story alive is to challenge it. Why the hell do they forget what the, what the West thinks? or what the West says, and get on and celebrate their achievements. Well, in some sense they do, that's all they say in, in, within China. We don't get criticism of things in China. The social, me the social media is really interesting and challenging that. So is that propaganda? Yes, we call the Ministry of, of Communication or Information the Propaganda Department. That's its name, that's what propaganda translates as in terms of the Chinese characteristic. But is it also linked to this notion of face? <laughs> that nobody in China is ever criticized. And there's this learning process that you learn by finding your own mistakes, which I don't think is particularly efficient. But nevertheless, that's a cultural way. So I don't know whether I've really answered your question. 
but so those are my first thoughts on them. Oh, thank you for that. Thanks very much. We, we, I, 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 a wonderful answer. I've, I've had one more question in the chat, which I don't think you're going to have time to answer. And it, it, and I, I will give David Love the, the final word almost because you're not going to be able to come back on this, which is, uh, you know, your thoughts on the extent to which the UK media has engaged in fake news to obscure the very, very high death rate and poor outcomes that we've had in this country. But I suspect that would be the topic of, of another hour's lecture. And um and, and a, an equally wonderful one. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna let you answer that because we are out of time. I am just gonna say, thank you so much for sharing that with us, Robert. Thank you very much to those who've come to listen. And perhaps if we, we can either unmute to clap or use the reactions, thanks very much. Thank you very much for listening and being there. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming. Um, we, for those who are, still here thank and thank you for putting up with the the, the small interruption in uh, in the program this afternoon thank you goodbye and robert will see you in in a few minutes okay thank you bye, bye.